So, and this is a reprise of the talk that we had here back in uh, a couple years ago. This is an update from from Harvard two years ago. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so actually, I wasn't directly involved with the UC project, but we were working on the sister sort of. I was work working on the, the server because of the UC. Um, so also doing Linux on small arm devices. And, uh, and we'd sort of gotten ramped up on doing kernel hacking about the time that the ITZY folks were getting really tired of it. And about the time that the IPAC came out. And um, they had, uh, I'm sure ahead of myself, they had a lot of interest outside the company to get uh, the ITZYs out to people. And it actually worked out a, a thing where they produced them for cost. Uh, but then that started looking a lot like the original IPAC, uh, this device. And the uh, marketing people said, oh, that would be confusing if we had a research prototype and we had the real thing. But um, you can port Linux to the real thing. So that was actually much better for us because there are a lot more of those to produce. We didn't have to worry about building hardware. We built hardware in the lab. And they built hardware in the West Coast lab. And, and we know how hard it is to actually produce uh, any sort of quantities. Um, we usually produce probably the worst case number, which is like 100. You know, one or two you can build by hand and rework until they work. Thousands you can get the production line, and the hundreds you just never get it right. Okay, so there we go. So the history stuff. Um, we started. We knew there was going to be this demand for Linux on the iPad. Uh, we didn't know how big it was going to be. But we decided to start a website outside the company, handheld.org, that was sort of vendor neutral. Uh, we try to keep it vendor neutral um, and try and bring in as many developers as we can. And uh, we'll talk some more about the success we've had with that. As I said, this uh, was derived from the work of Bill Hammerman and Joel Bartlett at Western Research Lab. Um, and we, they inspired it, and it really kicked off the, uh, the strong arm handheld. Uh, I'll talk more about the website, but we have source code, binary, the distribution. Uh, email list, uh, technical support. We even support Project PC on occasion. Um, we know more about the insides of the IPAC than, uh, than many of the people in the product group actually. Because um, we get down, a lot of, you know, a lot of it's outsourced to the software and the hardware. And we get down at a level to do the device driver work that they don't get down to with their work. And um, April 2000 was when we started this work. By June we had uh, X running on the IPAC on the X running by Actually, I think a month of that delay to get the, the, the website launch was getting the, um, the clearance for Microsoft. Okay, we're going to do this thing. Not really the clearance, but we had to go work it through them. Don't be surprised, but we're doing more. Oh, it's just a research. <laughs> so, so it's pretty good. So, I, I probably don't really have to set this up, but uh, why are we doing open source stuff? Well, we have full source binary availability. We can change anything in the system. And in our research work, we change, you know, the guts of things, and people doing application work change other, other parts of things. And it's just really nice to be able to change any piece on the whole system. Um, it's actually, in, in a way, it's better than a, a laptop or a PC, because there's not even a bias in the way. All the way down to firmware is our code. Um, the downside is that all the way down to firmware is our code. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time working on that. Um, one of the the things that have been leading us into this path from the research side is the advanced network and advanced security. So we have, uh, actually for two years now, we've been doing IPv6 and mobile IPv6 on the iPad. Um, we don't really, we have IPv6 sort of into a long time while we have the version lined up. Um, security, well, our first distribution two years ago, or two and a half years ago, we showed this. We had a telnet and all like our logic and all that stuff. And then we put all the stuff up outside of our logic and said, oh, take it off. Yeah, SSH, SSH, uh, DPG, uh, actually use GPG in our package upload and and protect the process environment, which we take for granted. But if you do pocket PC development, um, you find that it's just not there. Uh, all the things are basically not there in pocket PC. We worked with the product group on trying to enhance security of the, the main product, and much of our discussion sort of leads down to, well, if we have Linux under here, <laughs> it would just all be solved. Uh, or at least down at the end line there, and instead you have to work around all that stuff. Fundamentally, we view it as a computer. It's a computer in your hand, it has full networking, it has full connectivity. Um, it has the same APIs as the desktop that servers. And so it shares a lot of environment, uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of your expertise, a lot of the software that's out there. Uh, we can install Debian Arm Linux packages directly. 
mostly we repackage and, and build our own software um, for Sonic, but it's just the beginning. Um, sketchbook application approach. So, so this picture actually I showed to San Francisco. It doesn't look like it's quite much anymore, but that was our, our first, you know, the old PWM and, and, and X and basic stuff running on the iPad. Kind of easy on a handheld stuff. So that was just to show all the pieces of the book. Um, right now we're at Linux 2419 and I just dusted off 25 again. Uh, getting ready to shift to 25 for our development kit. There's a bunch of power management capabilities. I can show you two problems that, um, that are there in 2.5 and are, are really shoehorned into 2.4. Um, in file systems, we're going for the external file system. In the flash, I have a section I want to talk some more about what makes a handheld different from a regular PC and the much later in the talk. But for now, I'll just say there are compressed journaling flash file systems. The basic non volatile storage in my pack is, is flash memory. It has kind of interesting characteristics. Um, you can erase big chunks and you can write little chunks. And you can't rewrite without erasing the big chunks. And uh, it works out after having a thousand erases. So, you have to have a special file system for that. You want something that uh, is journaled so it behaves well if the battery dies or if you drop it or whatever. Um, and you want something compressed because 16 megabytes of flash isn't very much. 32 megabytes of the bigger unit is still not very much. Compression gives us a factor of 2 on that. Um, and then for external CF and microdrive and SD card, we like to use the SD3. Again, so if you unplug the thing in the middle of stuff, you're not going to end up in an infinite space. So, um, one thing we have now, so actually, most of these are new capabilities in terms of the iPad in the last two years. We have two different, uh, two different I'll talk about graphical interfaces. Um, one based on GTK, one based on GT. There's also been uh, Pocket Linux, which was a Java based thing, Java 2, um, Micro Windows, Pico, a bunch of other things. But these are sort of the, the main things. As on the desktop, the same toolkit seems to be predominating in the handheld world. We ported Java 2 Standard Edition a few years ago. A lot of people at MIT who were using the iPads used Java 2 Standard Edition because that's what they know. Um, it doesn't really fit in the iPad, but it does run if you have external storage to put the JVM micro edition there, but we don't use it much because it doesn't carry over the same API as everything else. So again, it's a workstation. <coughs> so since our life is so easy two years ago, we had the 3600. Um, it was pretty simple. <coughs> Hardly needed a device service for us. In the meantime, they came out with the version 3100, the 3700, which fortunately was really just the 3600 with the new name and the new name. Um, 3800, which had a uh, frame instead of ASICs and more capabilities. The 3900, which had variation on 3800 ASICs plus a different CPU. Um, the 5400, oh, and I missed the 1900. So I brought sort of a selection of these, um, which I'll pass around in a second when I talk about them. Uh, and uh, I just sort of note about the car. <coughs> We've done power management work to try and get the fleet time up to like two weeks, which means that you have everything turned off. Um, it really gets down to, you know, if you have a pin very high that shouldn't be, that'll cut it down from like, two weeks to overnight. Power consumption. Um, wow. It's really tough. Um, kind of interesting. We've had Jornada Linux sort of working. Uh, this is a, another interesting story. John Ancorn and I started working with him was here at MIT in the auction project. And we worked together on the next course of handheld. And then he moved to HP Labs, and then we moved to HP Labs. And we're working together now. Uh, there's a bunch of keyboards that play around. Uh, what, what, what is it? Um, Add on cards, yeah. And uh, in terms of sleeves, so PC card sleeves, CF sleeves, you can plug on wireless cards. But the new one has wireless built in. Uh, and then there's even VGA out cards. The Voyager is one that was, if I remember right, was made by HP, but discontinued. And there's another one, and Margie has one now that we're doing a port to to support video out from the iPad to plug into your uh, um, A bunch of uh, peripherals that are on here. And this is really one of the strengths of the iPad, I think, is that there is the expandability, both in terms of, of the sleeve capability that you can. <coughs> these things that pull out the memory bus, the PC card bus, 
and give you a bunch of you know one and two slot options. Uh, also the CF card expansion, and in the new model the SD card expansion for um, the really thin memory cards. And right for more more choices, we have uh, a whole bunch of other distribution. We had the original one that we pulled together, which really was derived from binaries that were built for the ISTE. Some of them were just repackaging the card along and carbon stuff and stuff. And uh, we carried that forward hand building a new release every two weeks. Um, <coughs> then we started doing a new distribution, which is more of Debian derived. Some packages built from scratch, some actually just repackaged from Debian packages. We call that familiar on familiar.handheld.org. And about the same time as familiar started, there's other distribution, which was a synonym for instance, um, for familiar instance, which is really just our Debian Linux installed on iPad, installing it with the root file system on a PC card drive, so you can have 100 megabytes of storage, or a gigabyte of storage, depending on where you're doing CF or, or micro drive. And I'll show some screenshots of that. So we have the box emulator running x86 Linux on top of our iPad Linux. Uh, <coughs> yeah, what's the CF thing? Uh, Compact Flash, and, uh, and I didn't bring any of those, but it's a it's a card about this big, and, um, and I had a couple in my hand as I walked out the door, not the mind. But you can get either CF up to there's one up to 512 megabytes, I think, and hard drive up to a gigabyte. Um, and I was only expecting two gigabytes to come out by now, but but nothing happened. Well, what happened was IBM sold that stuff to. to was it Hitachi that they sold? Hitachi. When was it? Right, so I don't know what's happening there. Um, in the meantime, Pearl Tech did something called QPE that they renamed it Utopia, and there's a variant of that that's fully open source that's called OP that we also host on handheld.org. The, the original Utopia isn't open source? But it's, I don't know. I hear all sorts of complaints about the license. So there's, there's partially open source, and uh, I don't know. It's right, as long as you're doing, if you're doing GPL stuff, it's okay, but if you're doing commercial stuff, you can't license it. So there, there's some people have issues with that. Um, and so OP is the, the fully GPL for that. And uh, so Pocket Linux, which is probably at the bottom, but it was Cafe JVM, XML stuff, <coughs> and, uh, and it sort of it was about a year ago. Um, so the familiar distribution has sort of pulled together both the GPE, which is a GTK-based X, GTK over X distribution, uh, actually <coughs> applications, and OP, and so you sort of your choice. If you want GTK, you can have that. If you want OP, you can have that. And we're working with the OP folks to get OP on GT on X so that you can seamlessly intermingle the two applications. Um, but we're not there yet. Um, so sort of changes later on In both distributions, we've got anti-alias spawns, we've got landscape and portrait mode, and then there's sort of different capabilities based on uh, EPE, which is X window system versus OP, which is directly on the framework. Does everybody help the picture they say? I assume there's more overhead in X, but I would like to know the difference. It's, yeah, well actually that question we've never answered. It's because uh, you know, QT Embedded pulls in has a lot of the stuff that an X server would have. So it has font rendering and all that stuff. And so I think they tech about the same amount of space, actually. Uh, because the, well, uh, yeah, I think, what else has changed? I guess the other thing that's changed recently, like the X 4.2 or 4.3, if that's the right numbers, 4.2 anyway, uh, is that the font rendering is moved into the client side. So now that looks very much like the way QT does it with font rendering on the client side. And I think they're both using true type fonts, and so that's reducing space consumption now, and you, know, you don't have all these bitmap fonts for all the different rotations and sizes to build up stuff on the fly. Um, I should say Jim Dennis and Keith Packard are both involved with this project, and they've been pushing X, and Keith's probably been 